we've all heard of images you can hear, but I can hear this image better than any on earth. And it sounds just like this. For myself and millions of other kids growing up, the first time we heard this song, we knew something magic was happening. I can't exactly describe it, but logging into MapleStory for the first time ever and just getting blasted with this soothing music and making my character for the first time, it all just felt so comforting. When I fire up a new game in 2023, I'm met with things that all feel generic. A generic cutscene, a generic character creator, a generic soundtrack. Rarely does it ever make me feel emotion. But still, almost 20 years later, I can remember the emotion that was invoked in me by playing MapleStory for the first time. I wasn't a kid who watched anime growing up that wasn't named Pokemon. I had no connection to the chibi art style or the chill ass music that's playing right now. But MapleStory managed to make its connection with me. And that is the magic that this game provided me and so, so many others growing up. To this day, when I'm not feeling so great, one of the greatest comforts to me is the MapleStory soundtrack. Call it weird if you want. It is. But I like it. So why did this game, this 2D side-scrolling chibi art style, side-scrolling combat social eastern audience geared toward MMO have this gigantic impact? We'll buckle in and we'll talk about it. In the early 2000s, we didn't have a lot of options for online free-to-play computer games. I was downloading every single free-to-play and every virus pretending to be a free-to-play game out there. I was browsing Miniclip for new Flash games. I was playing RuneScape in my browser. I would do anything and still would do anything to get some free online entertainment. However, 99% of the crap out there is exactly that. It's crap. In 2005, when my RuneScape buddies told me that this new MMO, MapleStory, was coming out, I was pretty convinced that MapleStory was going to be included in that 99% of crap. But boy was I glad I was wrong. Seeing the art and the 2D gameplay, I was just convinced that I was probably going to hate this game, but my friends were playing and I didn't want to have FOMO, so I gave it a shot. Going into MapleStory with a negative mindset, I never imagined that this game was going to grip me with the magic of its aura. But like I said at the start of this video, this is where it all began, and my mind would instantly be changed forever. Even though I had played RuneScape prior to playing MapleStory, my dumb kid self just didn't quite understand what an MMO was still, really. MapleStory has a much more classic approach to the MMO genre, meaning that you actually have to kind of choose what class you're going to play and what skill points you put into your character matter, and you have restrictions placed upon yourself based on what class you choose. Things that RuneScape never really implemented. Going forward, all of my experiences were on Maple Global, which was the international server that Nexon hosted. So if you had experiences on KMS, JMS, EMS, or whatever, they may be different than mine. The four classes that MapleStory had at its start were Warrior, Mage, Bowman, and Thief. Just learning that alone was enough to get the 11 year old version of me super hyped because I had never even played a game that had classes before. Every character you made started out as a beginner and then at level 8 or 10 you would advance into your first job and that would be your class that you were stuck with for the entire game going forward. Warriors can only equip warrior stuff, mages can only equip mage stuff, so on and so forth. Each class had two additional job advancements you can make, one at level 30 and another at level 70 which was added very shortly after the launch of Global MapleStory. Doing a job advancement in MapleStory basically unlocks new abilities for your character to use giving you a couple extra buttons to press while you're grinding. So for my first character I started up my grind to level 10 which just took hours and hours because one my brain was underdeveloped and two old school MapleStory was a grind like no other which we will talk about plenty later in this video. There were three classes that advanced their job at level 10, being Warrior, Bowman, and Thief. And the Magicians advanced their job at level 8, for reasons I'm not even going to bother getting into. But the reason I say this is I chose to be a Bowman, which is why I had to get to level 10. So once you've grinded up to level 10 on Maple Island, you're ready to move on up to the big world of Victoria. Go make your job advancement and get into the meat and potatoes of what Maple Story really is. In my head at the time, there were two main things that you could do in Maple Story. Either kill a bunch of NPCs and grind up your level or go to one of the towns and just be social and talk to players. 
I could not imagine viewing being social as a feature in a game today in 2023. But for some reason, back in the day, MapleStory somehow perfectly captured the magic of making the social interaction into a real feature in their game. I think because back then the player base was so young and the game was so new and it wasn't exactly fleshed out with content and there wasn't a ton of guides available for you to look up and actually learn how to do anything in the game, that it just kind of created this perfect breeding ground for players to get to know each other and talk to each other a little bit. So let's get into the progression of Old School Maple Story a little bit. After you got to level 10 and made your job advancement, you got to Victoria Island, you were a social butterfly, you talked to all the players, they probably told you to go to this super famous spot, it's called Hanasis Hunting Grounds. From level 10 to 15, you probably just sat at this map and you killed snails at level 10 and then you killed slimes at level 11 and then you killed orange mushrooms at level 13 and you killed green mushrooms at level 15 or something like that. And every time you leveled up, you kind of just moved up the map and killed the stronger monsters. And because the game was new, there was seriously like 100 players in this map at any given time. It was crazy back in the day how popular this map was. Now it's a real toss up as far as how iconic these two places are, but Hanasis Hunting Grounds from level 10 to 15, super iconic, but just as iconic I think, Pig Beach at level 15. From level 15 to 21, everyone went to Pig Beach. You learned what a hidden map was because of Pig Beach. You died to the Iron Pig on Pig Beach because we all didn't have mains to come kill the Iron Pig. So we would just get slaughtered by that thing until some kind soul who was over level 30 would actually come and kill that thing for us. Bless. So that was kind of the meta established for a new character at the time. You make your new character and you get to level 21 by grinding out from Maple Island to Hunting Grounds to Pig Beach. At level 21, the reason I'm making this video happens, the most special thing to me in MMO gaming happens, and it's a amazing feature that MapleStory had that combined the social aspect of the game with the absolutely awful grind of the game, and they were called Party Quests. On the surface to a new player, level 21 doesn't seem significant at all. You probably got told at some point to go to Pig Beach and you killed thousands of little piggies for hours to get to level 21. Just like someone probably told you to go to Pig Beach at level 15, somebody told you to go to Kerning City at level 21 and go stand in front of those stinky sewers and go have the best time of your childhood. Hanging out in front of the Curting City sewers here is this magic looking lady named Lakeless who gave me digital crack at a young age and is the reason we have this video. Here's the format of a party quest in MapleStory so you like actually know what it means. Four players would join a party to do a mini quest together where they would have to solve puzzles and kill things to complete it. But it gets much more convoluted than this. If you were a solo player, you would go to channel one on the server that you chose, which at the time there were probably like four or five servers and I was a Windia player shout out Windia you would go to channel one and you would say joining PQ to get recruited by a party leader to try to join another party to get up to four players each server only had 20 channels that players could join which were like separate instances of themselves each channel could have one party quest running at a time so at most 20 party quests could be going on one server at once so you would assemble your group of Avengers and then you would jump between channel to channel to channel to try to find an empty channel where no one was actively doing a party quest at the time. There was a problem with this because MapleStory was super popular back then, so all 20 channels were pretty much always full. Thankfully, MapleStory was a social game and there were some smart kids out there who figured out something called tracking. See, MapleStory had a social feature that you could type into the chat and type slash track and then a player's username, and it would tell you the exact map that that player was standing on at that time. On the surface, it's kind of useless. It's more of like a way to figure out where your friends are in game so you can go meet up with them. So if you knew the username of a player who was in a party quest in your channel at that time, you could type slash track and get what map they're on. Therefore, when they are out of the party quest, it will say that they are no longer in the party quest map. And then it's your turn to spam click on the NPC to try to beat them into it because they, when they exit the party quest, get spawned to a different part of the map and have to run back to the uh, 
wonderful NPC Lakeless. So basically, if you made any friends party questing, they're going to be running through their buddy list every day to see if you are in a party quest so that they can steal your spot with their new party that they probably made today. That was just reality, bro. I got no regrets. All right, so now all the drama's over, you're actually into the party quest, right? What does that mean? So in Kerning City Party Quest, in stage one, you would have to go up to the NPC and they would give you a little quiz like, how much strength do you need to become a warrior? And you think to your dumb little self, I need 35 strength if I wanted to become a warrior. And you knew that because you were a nerd who did 40 million Kerning City Party Quests to this point, and you just, you just had that memorized at this point. So you would go and kill 35 alligators, and they would each drop a coupon, and then you would take those 35 coupons, give them back to your party leader, Every single player on the team would have to do this. When you have four passes or three passes, I guess, because the party leader doesn't technically have to do it, you can then advance to the second stage. The second stage is just like a little rope puzzle. Three players stand on a rope. You try to see if the combination's correct. If it doesn't work, you change it up, you move on. Next stage is a bunch of barrels. Literally the exact same thing, just barrels instead of ropes. The final stage is more fun. You go down, you kill some little, some little guys, you kill some bigger, bigger guys, and then you gotta kill the King Slime as a squad. You and the squad take down the King Slime, you get all your passes, you go up to the final NPC, and you have completed the Kerning City Party Quest. So, why would you want to complete a Kerning City Party Quest? What's so fun about it? Well, for one, it, it perfectly combined the social aspect of MapleStory with the absolute grind of MapleStory. Because getting a level up in MapleStory, it, it was like, I would rather go do a hard day's work on the farm, dude. It's hard to grind in MapleStory. Grinding in old school MapleStory, to be frank, it sucked. So from level 21 to 30, doing Kerning City Party Quest, you would get more experience than if you were just killing things on a map. It was the best experience in the game for that. On top of that, not only that, you would get rewards. So you complete the Kerning City Party Quest, you get out and in that process where you're sprinting back to the NPC to try to get back in to beat the team that's inevitably been tracking you on the other side to try to steal your spot, you get an item for completing the quest. And in these items that you get from completing the quest, it could be something useless like potions. It's not really useless, but it's not that great. But you could get a scroll and you want a scroll. The reason you want a scroll is because high level players would use these scrolls to enhance their gear. You're a noob. You're getting new gear every five levels or whatever. These players have already gotten their end game gear for whatever that is at the point. The only way they can make that gear better is by using these scrolls on them. So high level players who have a ton more Mesos, which by the way was the money in Maple Story, would come to Kerning City and buy these scrolls off of the noob newer players because that was how it rolled back then. So not only was it better experience and faster leveling up, you would also increase your wealth in the game. It was a win-win win 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 and not only that it was just the most fun content that old school maple story had man <sighs> so i just went completely off script for those couple minutes and i'm covered in sweat and i'm excited and i need to figure out where i am in the script script right back MapleStory's level cap on release was 200, which if you've been keeping up so far is very far away from the level 30, which is the last level you're allowed to do the Kerning City Party Quest, which we just spoke about. So what did players do after that? Well, you'd get your second job advancement, and then after that, all there really was to do was grind and kill mobs. And I'm not gonna lie to you, man, it was slow. The good news is, is that Nexon realized that even casual players loved the Party Quest format. So they started making more party quests in the game to break up the monotonous grind that was just killing an infinite amount of monsters to get a single level up. Next came Ludibrium PQ, and then Ellen Forest PQ, Hinesis PQ, Orbis PQ. They were just handing out PQs like Oprah was handing out cars, bro. You get a PQ, and you get a PQ, and you get a PQ, and you get a PQ. This, in general, was a good idea because the PQs were popular and it increased experience rates. But there's just a little part of me that felt like they made so many of the party quests that the format of party quests kind of became less special as time went on. I've spoken a few times about the absolute grind that old school Maple Store used to be. The progressive leveling system combined with a level 200 level cap that didn't have content fully fleshed out for it yet just made a hellish grind for the early adopters of MapleStory. At certain points in MapleStory history, you had like level 150 players killing level 90 mobs because it was the best thing for them to kill. Just 
for weeks to get a single level up, man. Throughout MapleStory's history, new updates would be released into the game, whole new areas like the previously mentioned Ludibrium or Aqua Road, and it was just a blast to see the huge crowds of players formed in front of the areas where we knew the next map was going to be added and we could go to that new world and just chatting with the players about the update that was going to come out days beforehand sometimes. Because Global MapleStory got updated after Korean MapleStory did, we always had an idea of what updates were coming out beforehand and can kind of see the content before it happened, which was cool but also not cool because we got spoiled on everything but that's okay back in this day the rank one fight was between two players from the scania server tiger and sushi does anybody remember this am i the only one on earth should i be embarrassed this was long before the first ever level 200 achieved by legendary player Fangblade. So back to the gameplay, slowly over the years, Nexon will release more and more expansions to the game to try to fix the never ending problem that they had of needing to provide content for their higher level players who were still killing mobs way too far below them. Eventually, Nexon threw in the towel on their problem that they've created with their MMO and they released the most polarizing update ever to hit MapleStory, the Big Bang update. Appropriately named, the Big Bang update forever changed MapleStory. Polarizing is the perfect word to describe it. Some players clicked log out and never logged back in, and some players fell into an even deeper pit of addiction that they're still in today. When I say that this update completely changed everything MapleStory players knew prior to December 2010, I really mean it. At the flip of a switch, your character's level was basically irrelevant. All of the formulas for your XP and your damage had been completely reworked. All the maps you were used to were changed and looked different. The monster spawn rates were different. You could play in HD now, which was cool, but a lot of those other things that changed really changed, man. In general, I think they just changed way too much. And unfortunately, MapleStory would just never be the same. The Big Bang update did fix a lot of the things that old school MapleStory suffered from in its first five years of existence. But I don't really want to talk about all the technical changes that the Big Bang update did. What I really want to talk about is the feelings that the Big Bang update invoked within me. I played the Big Bang update and I did enjoy it for a little bit, but ultimately I realized that my feelings toward MapleStory were going to change forever for the worse going forward. Everything that felt so comforting about MapleStory all kind of felt unfamiliar now. My character that was in the level 50s felt worthless because you could get level 50 in a day now and getting level 50 took me hundreds of hours, not to mention all the level 30 to 50 characters that I had stocked up because I like to try all the classes, man. I understand why the Big Bang update happened. I get its purpose. They needed to fix the end game of MapleStory. Months of gameplay to get to level 30 for some people isn't acceptable, but to me it was at the time for some reason. To me, MapleStory died in late 2010. MapleStory is still online and running today. It's technically growing if you ask Nexon. But Nexon is missing out on an actual money printing press by not doing what some other Western MMOs have done in recent years, which is releasing classic versions of their games. Am I saying that Nexon should re-release GMS version 0.02 from 2005? Absolutely not. But let's dive a little deeper and see what could actually work. The current iteration of MapleStory is shockingly similar to the current iteration of RuneScape 3. A smaller player base than their heyday, absolutely slam full of microtransactions, trying to make a 20 year old game feel fresh, never ending power creep, they share a lot of things. So why not create old school MapleStory, OSMS, in a way that old school RuneScape, OSRS, exists today, in a way. See, the classic version of MapleStory has about 37 million different flaws that need to be addressed, which is why the Big Bang update happened in the first place, but I believe in Nexon, they could really make a classic version of MapleStory that was playable today. I could picture day one of OSMS right now. They would give us Victoria Island and Ludibrium and Orbis just right off the start. They would increase the EXP rates, maybe change change the whole way the mob system works with the level cap. They, they, they could change things about the classic game to make it more fleshed out. And then this would be the best part. All updates would have to be filtered through the community. Just like old school RuneScape filters all their updates through their community with the polling system. 
Of course, they would have to remove the pay to win aspect of the game, which they've already proven they're willing to do with the reboot server. Cosmetics could totally drive this game, but I'll make it even better for you. I would pay a subscription fee the same way that I would for RuneScape. Why wouldn't I pay $10 a month to enjoy classic MapleStory reimagined? I would love that. Now I could make an entire video of like a wish list of what I would want in an old school Maple story, but let's not go down that rabbit hole. So I'll stop that part of this here. The point is, is that myself and probably an actual million other people would at least log in and try some sort of version of old school Maple story. I know this is all just a pipe dream, but damn, I would love to just do a Kerning City PQ with three strangers and just use my teeny weeny little abilities and just have a good time and feel like a kid again. Currently, there's actually a few old school MapleStory private servers out there. They basically took an older version of MapleStory and tried to put their own spin on a classic approach to the game. There are thousands of players logged in right now playing an old classic version of MapleStory pretty much with its flaws and all. That just goes to show you that there is still a community out there who really cares about this. Because these private servers are just plagued by what old school MapleStory was always plagued with, and because Nexon doesn't approve of these private servers, give us what we want, Nexon, please. I appreciate you watching. I've now done a video on my three favorite games, which is awesome, RuneScape, MapleStory, and Guns, my three childhood favorite games, they're all done. What would you like to see next? If you watched this far, leave a comment. What did you like about MapleStory? Did you ever play MapleStory? Do you care about MapleStory? This was a huge long project. I've recorded it multiple times. I hope this audio worked. I had to replace this cable because I recorded the audio and it was all blown out. It didn't work. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching guys. See ya.